Well, good afternoon once again, ladies and gentlemen. I'll try not to shout as I did downstairs. It's a real pleasure to see you all here today on this, our 10th Donor Day. And one of the features of this event is to, if we can, take the occasion around the campuses. So for those of you who have been here before, you might have been over in Greenlands, you might have been elsewhere on this site, and of course here we are today in this wonderful setting of the ICMA Centre. It's a great place to be because in itself it represents the power of philanthropy because of the very generous donation that we received to enable us to develop this structure. I'm also hugely grateful to our friends and colleagues in Haslam's for their continuing support for this day and I'm grateful to them and for so many uh, colleagues who have joined Conrad Hill here with us. So thank you very much for that sponsorship. We really do appreciate it. We've got today uh, every, or just about it feels, every graduation year since 1949 represented. And I won't ask you to identify yourself. <laughs> you all look so young. <laughs> No, I'm not running for election, in case you are. <laughs> but that's a great feature of a day like this, that so many people feel that uh, continuing connection to the university. And of course, not only those who are associated through studying here, but others who, through their generosity, have helped the university. We are so grateful to you for being here. And I always think of this as a kind of extended family day. Because many of you in the audience will be here accompanying somebody who has an academic connection to Reading, and you too are um, <coughs> welcome. We were speculating <coughs> earlier in the week about the weather, and our first look at it, I think on Wednesday, uh, suggested that 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock on Saturday would be rain. Mm. But a uh, recent review of the weather has demonstrated that it's 6 o'clock tonight, <laughs> rain and raining, we don't care. <laughs> I hope you've had the opportunity to be outside to speak to some of the students and others who are <coughs> beneficiaries of your generosity. <coughs> and we are um, obviously just so pleased to have such a beautiful campus. You won't be surprised to know that we seem to win year on year these various awards for the most special and the most green campus. And the place really does look um, absolutely magnificent. I actually think it looks like that all year round because personally my own favourite time of the year is autumn. And I think on this campus particularly, you see such beautiful and, uh, a, I think, thought-provoking autumn colours. Now, one of the privileges uh, amongst many of being the Vice-Chancellor is you, you get the chance for a few moments uh, to make some comments and to identify some highlights of the year. Equally, I'm very aware that there are two main attractions this afternoon. So I promise you I won't overstay my welcome at the front uh, of the room. But just to give you one or two uh, highlights, features that I think make our university so special. We have around 17,000 students. Uh, we have about 25% of our students now coming from overseas. We have around 60% 60, 60 undergraduates and the remainder of our students studying postgraduate qualifications, diplomas and engaged with the university in another way. We are a place that students <coughs> seem to enjoy coming to study and uh, a couple of weeks ago in one of those many uh, student experience surveys we had gone up uh, a number of places and are now uh, I'm pleased to say in the top 25. I think another interesting feature in this uh, rather dynamic time, that's a, a one way of describing it for higher education, uh, that we're seeing very encouraging uh, uh, and uh, continuing interest amongst undergraduate applicants for the university. So for example, for this um, coming uh, entry year, September 2015, we've seen a 20% increase in applications. 
and that's set against a 2% increase uh, nationally. Now, of course, there's a lot to do between a student um, saying they want to come here and actually walking through the door. But we're working very hard to encourage those applicants uh, to come here to the university. And I think it's a, a very interesting signal, however, of uh, the university becoming um, increasingly well known, people talking much more about what we're doing. We always knew, you always knew, what a great place uh, this is to study and to work. But we wanted to make sure that that message was more uh, widely known. A very important feature for the university in recent times has been preparing for the National Research Evaluation Exercise. It's called the Research Excellence Framework. And this kind of exercise takes place approximately every five or six years. And this is a, a way in which, uh, through peer review, the academic research of universities across the country um, is evaluated. And we were pleased, very pleased, that our uh, position was well and truly consolidated as one of the leading research-intensive universities in the country. And indeed, our research uh, power, in a sense, a, a, a measure of the quality of the research that we do um, and the number of people, academics, who are entered for this research exercise moved us up, as did um, another measure, what's called the research intensity measure, the percentage of all the academic staff who could be entered that actually were entered. And we've done extremely well on those measures. And I think that's a, a powerful, powerful demonstration of the uh, world-leading research that continues to take place uh, in this uh, university. It's been a busy day on campus because elsewhere this very afternoon um, our School of Politics, Economics and International Relations is running a Democracy Day event inviting local politicians, students, staff, members of the community to uh, do something that I think the politicians aren't doing and that is actually talking about the issues that matter in the election campaign. So this afternoon on another part of campus uh, a number of our academics are talking through the big issues and I hope engendering some kind of excitement because I don't know about you but this must be the most boring election campaign <laughs> in history. I cite that as an example of the real connection that is made between much of what we do, both through our academic research and just our work more generally, with the wider community. And that school, like many other academic schools in the university, has a really powerful impact on the wider world. And I think that's something that Reading has always been known for and something that I think we are doing in an increasingly significant uh, and powerful way. Just thinking into the future, we want to, of course, maintain our research standing, and we've got a very, very ambitious 2020 research plan coming to fruition, which, yes, will develop and consolidate what we've got, but I hope take us into <coughs> exciting new areas as well. We're also introducing some new academic disciplines. So from 2016, we will be opening a School of Architecture here at the university. And if you think of a number of the other disciplines that the university is known for in areas like real estate and planning, in construction management, uh, and so on, it's perhaps a surprise that we haven't got architecture but we're going to uh, m we're going to mend that by ensuring that we run I hope a very innovative architecture program from next year we're also introducing from this year um, uh, Spanish as an undergraduate discipline uh, this is a university that has um, maintained its position and standing 
in respect of modern foreign languages. That's not the case everywhere, I think, as you will probably appreciate. And so with Spanish, that will give us four modern languages and two ancient languages being taught here. And I think that's a really important signal that we are giving uh, to the continuing importance for students and I believe for our nation in uh, ensuring that many students come to study those subjects. There are lots of other developments on campus and more to come. I think I said in a previous uh, occasion that we were, uh, is it were developing the library in stages and that process has continued as we've done lot of the refurbishment inside the library and any of you who um, uh, read the who are readers of the Financial Times might have seen a few weeks ago a quite a large feature from the weekend magazine uh, where the Financial Times journalist decided to see whether students actually did study 24 hours a day in the 24 hours a day open library <laughs> I think she was quite surprised to find that they did <laughs> and they were studying 24 hours a day and indeed we've got a very ambitious plan now to, uh, uh, to, to finish that work by completely remodelling the ground floor and I hope doing something very special to the exterior of the building which will add a bit more space but also I think uh, uh, bring it back to um, its glory. We actually celebrated the 50th anniversary of the opening of the University Library last year. And some of you might even have been present at the event. And we were so pleased that one of our graduates, Dame Lynn Brindley, who went on to run the British Library, came back to give a lecture to celebrate at that event. Next year is a very big year for the University. It's our 90th anniversary as a chartered institution. On the 17th of March, 1926, uh, the news came through that uh, the university had been awarded its royal charter. Um, the then principal, who became the first vice chancellor, W.M. Childs, was uh, carried around uh, triumphantly by students <laughs> on a sedan. <laughs> and I'd just been thinking about how we might celebrate. <laughs> but we will, we will celebrate it in a big and special way because it's an important uh, moment in the university system. I should perhaps just give you some advance notice that we do hope to do something very special on the 17th of March itself and uh, we hope that as many of you will be able to be present at that and then we might be doing something else um, that represents our uh, forward ambitions with our donors, our alumni and so on later in the year. So it's a really, really uh, big, big year and, and of course in all that I said, uh, friends, the, philanth the philanthropic giving, the generosity of you and many others is terribly, terribly important to this uh, university. And the, I've already mentioned uh, our presence in this building. Uh, we are, of course, here in this building, which is part of the wider Henley Business School. And uh, we know that the, the, the generosity being shown by graduates is, one th is something that happens immediately. So the graduating class making uh, a gift with now over 60 Henley alumni donating in this way. The Reading Real Estate Foundation, uh, which is an education charity supported by the Reading Real Estate Foundation, is helping to open up access to real estate study here at the university. Uh, the leading place to study real estate. But we want to make sure that every student, whatever their background, has the opportunity to study. And that's been supported by the generosity of many uh, donors as well. We're also, of course, um, pleased that many people continue to support through our telephone campaigns. And one of the great pleasures 
is, that we, is when we sit uh, and consider how we're going to make use of your generous donations in ways that really do benefit um, the students here. The students benefit from initiatives that we're able to support to promote innovative teaching and learning. The students benefit through the ways in which we are able to support clubs, activities and societies, some of which you have seen already today. Those are all really, really important ways in which your generosity makes a difference. Our family of supporters now um, counts around 7,250 people, uh, and that includes many alumni who've left legacies to the university. Um, I'm told that there's, uh, of course, that research that um, shows that people who leave a legacy, on average, live slightly longer than those <laughs> That's both good news and bad news. <laughs> but seriously, we are um, uh, enormously grateful to folks who have been prepared to um, make that kind of uh, commitment to the university, which uh, genuinely will um, uh, be of benefit to generations to come. But the support that we get from friends, alumni, supporters is not just financial. People in this room I know support our current students through providing mentoring, providing careers advice, coming in and supporting in all sorts of different ways. And that really matters because it's all very well, um, those of us who work here, um, talking about um, life beyond the university, but when they have the chance to speak to former students of the university, it brings that experience to life about what a great uh, grounding they get here at the university and how life then opens up uh, for them. So, ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you very much for coming today. Thank you for your enormous generous generosity in supporting us. And I hope that you will continue to, pay, to feel that you are a very special part of the Reading community. I'm now very pleased to move us on to the first of our two uh, showcase uh, presentations. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the Hugh Sinclair Unit of Human Nutrition. Julie Lovegrove, uh, Professor of Human Nutrition and Head of the Hugh Sinclair Unit, along with uh, postgraduate students, uh, Rosalind uh, Fellaise and Alice Turner, are going to showcase some of the outstanding and innovative work from the unit. And their presentation is going to include examples of, in a sense, what I said earlier, how the research that we're doing here is having a real impact on lives beyond. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Julie Lovegrove. Thank you very much. David and, and welcome everyone again to the University of Reading. As David said, we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Hugh Sinclair Unit of Human Nutrition this year. We were founded in 1995 from a competitively won endowment trust from the late Hugh MacDonald Sinclair. We now have a clinical unit and cutting edge laboratories in which we can do a lot of molecular and clinical measurements. And our mission statement of the Hugh Sinclair Unit is to strengthen the evidence base for dietary recommendations for the prevention of degenerative diseases. And this is very much following on from Hugh Sinclair's work himself. Hugh was a passionate and dedicated scientist and really put his life into the nutrition research and how important that was in prevention of disease. He started off his scientific <coughs> career at, Laura, at um, Oriel College in Oxford, taking a degree in physiology, later getting a doctorate in medicine from the University College London. He did a lot of his work actually at Magdalen College in Oxford, um, uh, in which, excuse me, uh, where he was promoted uh, in 1951 to reader. And he was the first academic to have nutrition in his academic title. 
He's known for a lot of things, but probably the most well known is that of his dietary surveys during the World, World War II and, and post-war times, and also his passion and conviction of the importance of certain fats called long-chain N3 polyunsaturated fats found in fish oils, and their importance to promotion of health. In his latter years, uh, Professor Sinclair was a visiting professor at the University of Reading and performed lectures that the students actually came to and enjoyed very much. <laughs> so I'd like to just go through some of his work. Hugh Sinclair became interested in the potential impact of fish oils when he visited Greenland during the wartime to look at snow blindness. However, when he was there, he became particularly interested in the diets of the Inuit populations there that were actually very high in fat, which is usually associated, or at that time, to be believed to be associated with, with increased cardiovascular disease. However, they had a high amount of long-chain N3 PUFAs. And if to put this into context, the amount of uh, fat that we are eating in uh, this room, an average amount, is contributing to about 35% of our energy, and the, the Inuits are about 50 to 65%. And we are eating about 0.2 of a gram of long chain in three poofers, whereas these populations are eating about 10 grams. But they were found to have almost no ischemic heart disease. And this really stimulated Hugh Sinclair's interest. He then wrote a seminar article or a letter in a leading medical journal called The Lancet. And within this, he stated, the cause of death have been increasing <coughs> most in recent years are lung cancer, coronary thrombosis, and leukemia. And I believe in all three of these cases, essential fatty acids, meaning the long chain and three poofers, may be important. Unfortunately, the scientific community of the time did not recognise the potential of these fatty acids, and he was often shunned in his uh, opinion of this. Unable to get funding to look at this in more detail, he performed in 1979, at the ripe old age of 69, a study on himself to try and prove this um, link. And this is the famous 100-day seal meat study. During this study, Hugh Sinclair himself consumed only seal meat, fish and water for 100 days. You can see in this picture here, the staff in Magdalen College mincing up some seal meat. And it's not really bad, so I understand. What he wanted to determine was how this diet, that is representative of the Inuit population, impacted on thrombosis. Before we can have a heart attack, we need to have blood clotting and a thrombus formation. So what he did, in a relatively crude manner, but quite effectively, is this is his arm here. He's actually cut his own arm and measured the length of time it took for his blood to clot. And some amazing results resulted from this. You can see here, before he went on this diet, it took him about three minutes to clot. However, after about 100 days on this diet, it took him over an hour for his blood to clot. So an enormous increase in clotting time showing that the importance of these fatty acids in reducing clotting. However, a side effect of this, my colleague, um, <laughs> that it causes his employees to fill with blood when he was pruning the roses. <laughs> and he was a very keen gardener. <laughs> so despite the fact that this unfortunately wasn't published, this did stimulate a lot of interest. And since this time, many people, including those members of the Hugh Sinclair unit have continued the research into the benefits of long chain in three poofers. And it was in the year 1991 when the Committee on Medical Aspects of Foods actually made a dietary recommendation which were um, updated in 2004 to recommend that we have at least two servings of fish a week, one of which being oily, giving about half a gram of this long chain in three poofer. So it was a shame that it was actually only a year after his death that this particular recommendation um, was made, and shows how his work important it was for policy making. Another very important area of his research was that of dietary surveys. And the Ministry of Health in 1942 asked Hugh Sinclair to, re to lead what was called the Oxford Nutrition Survey, later become the Laboratory of Human Nutrition. And these were very detailed surveys looking at people's diets, the foods they ate, 
the amount, the price, and where they got them from. And this was amazingly interesting and important during the wartime and after that. He also did a number of functional markers or biomarkers of intake, including that of examining the eyes, in which this is Hugh Sinclair um, examining this lady's eyes, to determine the vitamin A status of this group. This was used during wartime years, as I say, to inform rationing. They found that in pregnant women, there was an increase in the deficiency in a number of different uh, nutrients, protein, iron, vitamin A and vitamin C. This stimulated an increase in the rationing for this group of pregnant women, increasing fruit and vegetables, particularly fruit, dairy products and cod liver oil. And they found a number of years later when re-examining re this group, there was a reduction in the deficiency in vitamin A and vitamin C. This work was also very important in informing fortification, for example, of flour that we still have fortified today, and also the forerunner of a number of important surveys like the NDNS, the National Diet Nutritional Survey, still being performed today. Hugh Sinclair was meticulous in his record keeping and also an avid hoarder of everything. And this is him in his office and you can see quite a lot of papers there. <laughs> that were unfortunately a lot of them unpublished, so therefore it's very unique data. And in 2008, the university employed Hayley Whiting, who's an archivist, to look at all his data and to archive it. And it's now held in the Museum of English Rural Life at the University of Reading, and was open for public um, viewing in 2013. She had a big challenge on her hands, faced with over a thousand office storage boxes and papers. And on anecdotally, although it's a big challenge, she's found it quite enjoyable. With her favourite bits being a large plastic map ball that was actually given to her by the University of Reading students when Hugh Sinclair retired. And also photographs of Hugh Sinclair on his overseas travels, and he did a lot of travelling abroad. Lee's favourite was that of envelopes of hair not knowing where they come from, <laughs> and also a bottle of 30-year-old macrolide, which again, I don't imagine smelled too pleasant. So I hope I've given you a taste of Hugh Sinclair's work, his passion for the science of nutrition, and how important his work was for policy development in the future. And we at the Hugh Sinclair unit are very proud to have his name associated with us. We were founded in 1995, and Professor Christine Williams was the head of the unit at that time, who really was instrumental in establishing us with an international reputation that we have today. On retiring, or on, on, uh, retiring from this position and being promoted to Dean and later Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Reading, was taken um, over by Professor Ian Rowland here, who steered us through and increased our capacity until his retirement in 2000, end of 2013, where I had the privilege of taking on this position. And you can see from in 1995, where there was Christine and myself, we've increased in capacity and also numbers <coughs> to about 80 of us uh, currently. We're very passionate, as Hugh Sinclair was, to increase the evidence base for reduction in chronic diseases. And this slide here shows that the two major killers within the world and the UK are cardiovascular diseases and cancer. With our increasing ageing population, also cognitive decline, and some um, illnesses such as Alzheimer's disease are particularly important and of interest to us. I'd just like to highlight a few of the areas of, of interest to us, and Ros and Alice will go on to look at them in a little bit more detail. <coughs> We're interested in looking at research that underpins nutritional policy, but also the mechanisms of action. How do these nutrients actually perform the benefit that we find? We're interested in looking at the variability in the population, often due to the genetic variation, looking at barriers of um, prevention or reduction in uh, motivation to change, and we do this by performing epidemiological and randomly controlled intervention studies. We are fortunate in getting funding from uh, research councils, from charities and also industry, which uh, counted for about three million last year. And we're interested in looking at a lot of different areas. 
looking at fruits and vegetables, the quantity and the type of fruit and vegetables that reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. Interest in nitrate-rich vegetables such as beetroot, reducing blood pressure and helping the health of our blood vessels. In relation to blueberries, in cognitive function. Looking at dairy products and reduction in cardiovascular risk. Optimum fat to promote health. Again, continuing Hugh Sinclair's work on the importance of long chain and three poofers. Trying to determine why certain foods such as processed red meats may cause cancer, and also the optimum type of carbohydrates in our diet. And as I say, very interested in looking at our genetic makeup and how that may uh, impact on our responsiveness to diets. One of our key recommendations um, to reduce cardiovascular <coughs> disease is that of reducing saturated fat in our diet. But this recommendation was challenged recently. And these are just some headlines from last year um, that are questioning whether saturated fat reduction is a benefit. And in the Hugh Sinclair unit, we're very passionate about determining what is the optimum fat to reduce, promote health and reduce cardiovascular disease. And this is just examples of one study that was funded by the Department of Health, looking at just under 200 people for a four-month period, putting them on either a high-saturated fat diet, a high-monounsaturated fat diet, for example, olive oil, or a high-polyunsaturated fat, for example, sunflower oil. And we were looking at the impact of this on a number of risk factors, and actually found that those on the saturated fat diet had a significant increase in plasma cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, LDL, or low-density lipoprotein cholesterol, but actually after following unsaturated fat, either mono or poly, had a significant reduction in this. We also found within this study and others that saturated fat also had a detrimental effect on blood pressure, which wasn't shown with unsaturated fats. And so this study, in addition to others run at the unit, have supported current nutrition policy to reduce our saturated fat to prevent or reduce the risk of developing cardiovascular disease. We're also very interested in looking at the types of fruits and vegetables that may cause um, uh, disease and or prevent, uh, to prevent uh, disease development. We can look at a number of different conditions and we're particularly interested in looking at blueberries or as an example of a fruit that contains substances called anthocyanins. And we found in Jeremy Spencer's group that when we look at the impact of eating two portions of blueberries in the form of a smoothie on cognitive function, we found quite a beneficial effect. Here, this is, our, this is before the drink was taken, and this was <coughs> one and five hours after. And this is the group that had the placebo drink. And you can see you get this post-meal, post-prandial lethargy or reduction in your cognitive function. I think we all know what that's like. <laughs> if you have a blueberry smoothie, you can actually see there's an increase in your ability to correctly uh, identify targets, which is maintained over about a five-hour period. And Jeremy's work has received quite a lot of media attention, and he's going on to try and determine the mechanisms of action and whether these particular fruits or the compounds they contain can help us in a number of degenerative diseases. So I hope I've given you a taste of Hugh Sinclair's life and, and some of the work that we perform at the Hugh Sinclair unit. He was a maverick of his time, but he was passionate about nutrition. And perhaps in the words of David Horobin, a colleague of Hugh Sinclair, perhaps he may prove to be one of those people whose long-term influence is far greater than ever seemed likely while he was alive. And we hope that the work that we do on the legacy of Hugh Sinclair, with my exceptional colleagues, academic colleagues, and dedicated research scientists, will further his passion for nutrition and real demonstration of how important what we eat has on health promotion. Thank you very much. PhD work on personalised nutrition. <coughs> so 
hi everyone. Uh, my name is Roz. I'm a PhD student in the Hugh Sinclair Unit. And I'm going to talk to you about today about some of my research on eating for your genes is personalised nutrition the answer. So some of you might have seen the BBC programme that was on recently uh, called The Right Diet for You. Um, does anyone see it? So in this show, yeah, they did target one group. Um, they deemed as the constant cravers and gave them advice based on the fact they found some genes that meant they were more likely to be hungry all the time. So these were genes relating to appetite. And they put them on something called an intermittent fasting diet and found that for these individuals, this was very relevant to them and they achieved better weight loss with this approach. And further to this, there's been papers published that show that when we put people on the right diet for their genotype, we see a greater weight loss than when they're put on the wrong diet for their genotype. So there's evidence that exists that suggests that using this approach might be more beneficial. And what we know is that individuals respond de very differently to different nutrients. So if we were to all go on the same diet in this audience, it's likely that some of us would get a benefit, so perhaps weight loss or a reduction in cholesterol, whereas others might not. So my PhD study has been working on a project called the Food for Me study. This was funded by the European Union and led by uh, Professor Mike Gibney at the University College Dublin and the study received um, £9 million funding and what we aimed to do in this was really look at um, the integrated analysis of the opportunities and challenges of personalised nutrition. So firstly, did it work? Were genes beneficial in giving dietary advice? Were people interested in this application of technology? Would it achieve behaviour change in individuals? And really we had two hypotheses for this. The first was does personalisation of dietary advice based on um, assist and motivate participants to follow guidelines? So at the moment we've got general dietary guidelines for the population, <coughs> things like you know have five fruit and veg a day and things like this, which we're telling everyone every day, but really the message doesn't seem to get across. So if we talk to people as individuals and say, for you this is most relevant, is that beneficial? And also if we use extra things like blood markers and do blood tests on people, if we go into the genetic level and say, you have a genotype that benefits, is this better for giving dietary advice? So the study was constructed across Europe in seven different countries. And actually we had a lot of interest for the Food For Me study, so over 5,500 participants across Europe attempted to join the study. Unfortunately we couldn't take these all on board and uh, we had to exclude uh, nearly 4,000. Some of this was due to intolerances um, such as nut allergies. It seems as this is the first study to really look into this, we had to be safe when we were recruited. And also we just didn't have the capacity to take that many people on board. What we did to make sure we could examine our aims is we had four different groups, the first of which we gave general dietary guidelines. So this was things like five fruit and veg a day, reduce your intake of saturated fat, have oily portions of fish. And the other three, we either gave advice on their dietary intake, so we asked them to fill in a questionnaire online and said, you, you particularly are deficient in this nutrient, perhaps you need to eat more omega-3, your intake of this is fine. Or we gave them advice based on their diet and bloods, so we sent them home testing kits, so something like the glucose kit, they prick their finger, put some blood on some spots, then we test it in the lab for blood cholesterol, blood glucose, markers of fruit and veg intake. And the third group got personalised advice based on their dietary intake, their bloods, and also five dietary responsive genes. So just an example, one of these genes is related to fat metabolism, and people with the risk variant of this gene um, tend to have a higher cholesterol and would benefit more from a low saturated fat diet. And what we found, which was what we were hoping, was that personalised nutrition was more affected. So for the groups who had the personalised diet, um, to work. Yep, we found that they had a better improvement in what we call the healthy eating index score. So over the course of the six month study, our personalised participants um, had a healthier diet at the end. They also had a greater reduction in salt, and salt is something we know can be linked to blood pressure, and it's something we tend to have too much of in the UK population. And also they had a greater reduction in saturated fat compared to our control participants. So we found out this model did work. And this is also something that we delivered online to mimic a potential business in the future. So actually in terms of the costs of using this promotion and 
promotion scenario in the future, um, it can be quite cost effective. So in summary, we found that internet-based dietary advice is more effective, personalised nutrition works, both from the researcher point of view, and also in benefiting salt and saturated fat reduction, which we know would have huge health implications on the population and reducing heart disease risk. Fortunately, or contrary to as expected, we didn't actually find a benefit of giving this extra advice based on blood and genes in our study. And there are several reasons for that. This was looking at a relatively healthy population. Some of the studies that have found a benefit have actually been focusing on weight loss or heart disease, where potentially the participants are more motivated and the advice might be more relevant to them as well. So we're conducting some psychology research into this to try and understand why it hasn't worked, whether it's more accurate for certain genes. So future research, what we'd like to do is look into the efficacy of this gene-based personalised nutrition, so how it works <coughs> in populations who perhaps need the advice a bit more, so those with high heart disease risk. We'd also like to see whether it's better to deliver this intervention face-to-face. -face. So as I said, we had an online study here, but perhaps if we're talking to people, we can give them more information and make sure that they appreciate or understand this knowledge, because it can be quite complicated. And that's not something that we were able to assess during the study. And finally, the best way to communicate gene-based personalised nutrition. So in the study, we framed it very positively and said, you have a gene that would benefit from this. But perhaps we need to let people know the real risks of having these genes to try and help motivate them to change their diets. So thank you for listening. If you would like any more information, we have a website for the study you can go on to, and hopefully our results will be published there. So now I'm going to pass on to Alice Turner, who's another PhD student. Thank you. So my name is Alice, and I'm in the final year of my PhD project, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it. So it's basically looking at whole grain and heart disease. So most of us know that whole grain is uh, good for us and the current recommendation is to eat three servings per day. Um, so we should in increase our consumption of products such as bread, whole grain pasta and brown rice and whole grain breakfast cereals. Uh, one of the reasons that whole grain is good for us is because it's beneficial to our heart. Um, it can reduce our risk of coronary heart disease, lower our cholesterol, reduce blood pressure, lower our BMI um, and this is all due to components which you may or may not have heard of, such as phytosterols, uh, carbohydrates, and the fibre. However, what some people um, may not be aware of is that whole grain also contains a high amount of something called phenolic um, compounds. And these have been found to be beneficial to the human body in many ways. One of these is via reducing um, heart disease. So the main phenolic compound in whole grain is something called ferulic acid. It's contained in the aluromea of the grain here, which makes up part of the outer husk, which is one of the reasons why eating the white equivalent um, is not as beneficial, because the outer husk is removed. So um, some of the... Uh, in, in whole grain, ferulic acid is mainly found in a bound form. And unless it's in a free form, it's not bioavailable for our body to use. So um, our microbiota in the gut is able to release some of the ferulic acid. However, only about 40% is actually reduced, uh, released. Therefore, we, in my project, um, use an enzyme which is able to release the ferulic acid. Um, and we used it in a bread product, product. So during the mixing process, we substituted some of the water with an enzyme, and then we produced flatbreads. So we ended up with three different flatbread products. We've, we had a white product, which has a low amount of ferulic acid in total. It's a whole grain product, which you'd buy if you were to buy flatbread products in the shops with a low amount of free ferulic acid and a higher amount of bound ferulic acid. Then we've got our whole grain active, which has got the enzyme in it, which has a higher amount of the free ferulic acid and a lower amount of bound. So we did a human clinical trial where we recruited 20 healthy male volunteers. They all came into the clinic um, 
for three visits and they had all three of the flatbread products on different occasions. And we measured various um, techniques and one, the main one is something called flow mediated dilatation which is where we, get, we use ultrasound um, but instead of looking for babies we look for <laughs> arteries. So um, we then put a pressure cuff around the arm and we increase the pressure so that <coughs> the arm basically goes completely dead and we restrict the blood flow. After five minutes we then release the blood pressure cuff and the blood returns and then the artery will respond to this increase in blood pressure. And we can then um, calculate a, um, how much the artery dilates, so we get a percentage. So the more they dilate, the better, because if your arteries aren't very flexible, then you can have high blood pressure, and it can also lead to atherosclerosis in later life. So here are some of my results. First, we looked at the urine of the volunteers, and we found that um, at two, the two, uh, after two hours, with the active product, we found there was an increase in free ferulic acid. So it is being absorbed by the body, more so than the white and the um, whole grain product. And here are the flow mediated dilatation results, and we found that <coughs> Here you can see this is the active product. There was an increase in dilation of the arteries at by two and five uh, time points compared to the white and the whole grain products. We also did some sensory analysis on the product. Um, uh, so we looked at different attributes such as appearance and taste attributes. And we found that um, we, we looked at five different flatbreads and they all had an increasing amount of enzyme in them from zero up to 25%. We found that, um, as you can see, the enzyme increases, so do attributes such as the yellow golden colour, the degree of bait, sweet taste, savoury taste, etc. But um, one of the, the findings that we liked the best was that um, in the consumer study, we didn't find any difference in liking. So when we added an enzyme, it didn't make the flatbread less desirable to the consumer. Um, so, at the moment I'm just writing up, I'm doing a little bit of blood analysis so we can see if it's similar to the urine, um, and I'd just like to thank everyone who helped me on the project. Well, I'm sure you would agree ladies and gentlemen, some uh, really interesting presentations. And we've got a few moments uh, for any questions from the audience. Perhaps you could indicate, we've got one microphone. I want everyone to hear the question. So if you'd like to ask a question, perhaps you might just raise your hand. Who would like to ask across any of the presentations? Question. Good, there's somebody there. Um, this is a slightly vinegary question uh, that you struck me in, the, in your introduction. Your, your sponsor, your uh, uh, man who gave you the money to set this up, just wondered what it actually he died of. I'm not quite sure the exact cause of his death. He died at the age of 80. So he was, he, he was a pretty ripe old age. I believe it might have been cardiovascular disease. <laughs> <laughs> However, actually during his SEAL study, the 100 day SEAL study uh, that he performed himself, he actually nearly caused himself to die. Um, it was really quite life threatening because he went from a you know, normal diet that, that we consume generally to this very um, different, a completely different diet with very high amounts of long-chain interleukin. So, although they're beneficial, I think to go to such great extremes in such a short period of time, yeah. I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> but I think he'd approve the point. I, I don't think I need a microphone, because I have almost as loud a voice as Sir David. Um, have you done any research, speaking here as one of the oldest members, I suspect, although I don't go back to 49, um, have you done any research on age 
from this point of view, that as one gets older, is there still, I ask this question with, I'm sure this is in several people's minds here, <laughs> is there any point in making... <laughs> <laughs> is related to increase in, in, in disease risk. So as we get older, we all get slightly higher blood pressure, we all, all, all get slightly higher, what's called insulin resistance and the like. However, diet still has an important impact on that. So as you say, even though we're all getting older, it's still, we still can benefit, can benefit from, our, from our diet. So yes, there's no excuse. <laughs> It was a serious thing. <laughs> 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 we'll get for one last, I think, somebody signal thank you, so we'll just get the mics for you. Um, question for Rosalind. Um, are you actually working with companies to provide kind of health advice through apps and give people a nudge to you know, change their lifestyle and you know, perhaps be useful for getting their research or how they work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, of us, one of our companies who worked with us on the project was Creme Nutritional Products. Uh, based in Ireland, and they helped to develop the web interface um, that we used on the study, so absolutely. But there are a lot of apps in development, and unfortunately they don't always come from the research environment. So it's something we're, we're treading quite carefully about, certainly with genetics, it's very much a new field, and we're trying to make sure we've got the evidence based first. But certainly this online platform and using social media and apps seems to be quite beneficial. It's very handy, you don't have to go to a clinic to see someone. Um, so it's something we'd like to move into once we know the evidence is strong enough to do so. I wonder if I might just abuse the uh, privilege of the front of the room and just ask if, um, any of you to answer, why is it we don't do what the science tells us to do when it comes to eating the right thing? Yeah, I, can try and, you know, I think, yeah, part of the, the premise of personalised nutrition, the same as you think, if you go and buy a car and the person asks you what you're doing, how it relates to your lifestyle, you know, makes it personal, then it certainly seems more appealing and is more motivating. So the key really to nutritional guidelines is, yes, it may be beneficial, but it's how can we motivate the individual to change their lifestyle, and actually that's very difficult to achieve. So one of the things we're doing within the context of the study is trying to, to find out what's motivating people. And the premise of personalised nutrition is really saying, look, you have this genetic predisposition. It's relevant to you. It's not just, you know, everyone do this and somebody's not going to get a benefit. If I get told to follow this diet and I will lose weight, if I don't lose weight, then I'm just going to lose faith and I'm not going to be motivated to do anything. So we're really trying to also, in addition to the guidelines, is work out how things motivate people, how we can enhance that, what we can do in the future to try and make sure that they follow the advice that we're finding is beneficial. Can I perhaps add to that as well? Um, I certainly agree with what Ross says, and I, and I think personalisation will help us, hopefully, motivate people to change, but it may be that we will have different personalities as well that needs to be looked at. And so we may have some people, if they know their risk of disease and they have a genetic predisposition, they might have a fatalistic attitude and think, I'm going to die from that, so I'll eat what I like. We hope that this doesn't occur and that some people, or the majority of people, will be motivated to change. But I think this aspect is also something that we need to consider in looking at that, what motivates someone. Some one person doesn't necessarily uh, motivate another. I just want to comment on that. And just <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you would agree that uh, Julie, Rose and Alice gave us a fascinating insight into the outstanding work being done by the Hugh Sinclair unit, so please show your appreciation. I should say that uh, Julie has asked me to remind you that um, there will be a sheet at the door if you wish to sign up for a 100 day seal meet. <laughs> <laughs> so, we move on to our next uh, presentation. <laughs> Professor Michael Fulford, Professor of Archaeology, is going to present to us highlights of the Silchester Town Life Project, which was completed in August 2014. And as well as being an excavation of huge archaeological interest, 
it was a training ground for 18 generations of Reading students as well as many from outside. Uh, so Mike is going to do his presentation and I know that he is also going to be supported by some students who have taken part. So ladies and gentlemen, Professor Mike. Please. Um, ladies and gentlemen, what I want to do this afternoon is, is give you a, a brief outline of, um, I think, a, a wonderful project, I, I hope you'll agree, um, that has engaged, as Sir David said, so many students over so many years and has achieved, I think, or is, a, is achieving a major contribution to our knowledge of, of um, Britain's past. So Silchester, I don't know whether many of you know the site, it's uh, a Roman, or at least we can now say it's an Iron Age and Roman town. It's about 10 miles south of Reading. It's one of a number of Roman towns in Britain, but one of only three which survives more or less intact, undisturbed by modern development. So it's a, it's a greenfield site. Um, Roxeter in Shropshire, Case of Norwich in Norfolk are similar, uh, but Silchester is the one which has this long history from, as we now know, from the pre-Roman Iron Age up until the early medieval period. So this is how it is, um, more or less today. You're looking, um, bottom is the west, you're looking up London. If you carried on up the screen, you would hit London. This is the site, um, and you see one of the classic hallmarks of the town, the Roman street grid which uh, people began to observe and see as crops ripe, ripened way back in the 16th and 17th century. So it's a site that's been known for a long time, but excavations of any consequence that were recorded didn't begin until the latter part of the 19th century. And those excavations culminated in a project, a 20-year project, which ended in 1909, which exposed this plan, which has now become a hallmark, if you like, of Roman Britain. It's, it is, in some senses, the most extensively excavated site in the Roman Empire, so more extensively than, for example, Pompeii or some of the North African sites that you might have visited, but in another sense is actually also almost unknown. Those excavations, in, in, in modern times, one would obtain something similar to this by using techniques of geophysics and aerial photography, but in the 1890s, 1900s, only way you could achieve this knowledge was by digging. And this plan is there. It has been regarded as the only um, town plan that we know of from the Roman world. But it actually is uh, it, 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 it's, it's misleading because it has no time depth to it. And uh, it's like as if one said Reading today was how Reading was in 1400 or uh, in 1800. So it gives you a false impression. But for most of the 20th century, it was regarded as a site fully exploited, nothing more to be learned. Um, but this is actually far from, far, far from the truth. So in 1997, following up from um, work in the 1980s, which began to indicate that the early uh, antiquarians had hardly um, really revealed anything much of the history of, of, of Silchester, we began this project in one of the rocks um, in the northwest part of the town, as, as you can see there, um, representing less than 1% of the area within the town walls. And that project began, this was the base knowledge in 1997, this from work of 1893 and 1894. It's the plan of one block. The, the Victorians numbered it nine, and it contained the area highlighted contained the remains of two buildings. That's almost the total knowledge that we had we were available to us in 1997. And there is, I think, only one note. There are two objects in the museum in Reading which can be related to the entirety of that insular. And now we have not just thousands, but millions of objects, <laughs> as you'll see. So we began, this was the University's training excavation in 1997. That's how we started. Um, very uh, modest enterprise. The area negotiated with um, English Heritage and the landowner, 
Hampshire County Council, um, and we continued. And the combination of the complexity and the richness of the archaeology, so little had been disturbed um, in this area in 1893-94, that it taken us um, 18 seasons. When we began, uh, my estimate was certainly five, but no more than 10. And um, as things, by the early 2000s, it became clear that we had a major project and um, it was going to take a while to complete. But there was no point in stopping because this was going to give us the first sort of history profile of a Roman town from, uh, as we um, believe from early work done, from pre-Rome to Rome. There's nothing else comparable um, in Britain. So we began, and gradually, with um, Amanda Clark directing the students, uh, <clears throat> we built up to a team varying in size between about 130 and 150. And 150, and that's about the number you see there assembled and uh, waving at the camera, 150 is about the maximum number whose, whose names um, uh, I'm not speaking personally here, but <laughs> certainly the names of Amanda uh, could, rem could remember and we could relate to and we could work with. So that's sort of the, a comfortable group. But the archaeology actually could have taken more, but then we would have needed more supervisors and so on. But that was, that was the, um, the, the, the team. And that team consisted predominantly of, of our students here, but we had a great number of six formers taking part and we had uh, work experience coming through. Uh, we had students from other universities in the UK, international students, and then a group of people who stayed with us for much of that 20 years, a sort of group of local um, enthusiasts who helped us in many ways and gave continuity as each, as were a new cohort of students who never done any archaeology before came to, to learn the basics of field archaeology. Uh, the infrastructure grew, um, and uh, providing the food um, was always became a, a challenge. Um, and look, it doesn't look very much there, but organising things like the toilets, I think we 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 tipped we topped them at 55 um, portable toilets. Um, Any one season, <laughs> these things become quite important. <laughs> <laughs> And in 2012, I don't remember 2012, there was a tremendous amount of rain and um, really actually quite difficult to get any form of mobile transport into the field. And what do you do when the portaloos are full? <laughs> I'll leave that for you to think about. <laughs> so it was a great project, people working together of all generations. So our age range really was 16 to the high 70s, so pretty much everybody here could have had an opportunity to take part in this project. Um, and working in the field, um, actually doing the archaeology and recording the archaeology, working on the, the, the finds, maintaining the infrastructure, you know, <laughs> cleaning the loops, um, a very important part of the life of the project. So. It was more than just obviously uh, working in the trench and excavating. They were working um, on the finds and working with visitors. And Will Wilson here will tell you a little bit at the end of uh, his experience at Silchester. And uh, Will was a great communicator to the hundreds, if not thousands, of visitors that we had coming to the site each year. So it gives you a sense of the activities, the variety of what was going on each summer at Silchester over our six-week seasons. And here are some visitors listening to, to talks, um, children coming, children in, in, engaging in the excavation, they learning, getting the, getting the idea of what archaeology is all about. Um, and we had these uh, open days, trying to bring in as many people as, as possible, twice a season, as well as people coming every day. Um, and um, the, the range of activities that we we're doing on site, we're covering that primary data, not just pulling out the ground and washing the pottery down a little bit, but also, and here um, uh, Lisa Lodwick is going to tell you a little about her work on the environmental remains, because one of the great contributions of this project to knowledge has been to learn much more, again, about food 
and a diet in uh, the period between the 1st century BC and the 5th century AD. And the painstaking work extracting plant remains, extracting microscopic um, uh, uh, food, animal bone, and the like. Um, so that's the sort of work going on there. Um, and this taking place in a variety of conditions. So I've mentioned 2012. Um, on the right of that slide, I think, was that was taken in 2007, July 2007, remember the floods of... Now, what do you do with 150 people when you can't actually... because your trench is a lake. Um, so that was uh, interesting. But then we did, and I think many people will have forgotten, but we also, in the trench, hit um, 40 centigrade on occasion over the 18 years. More in, in the, I suppose, the middle years. Not recently, I don't think we can remember many 40 degrees, can we, in the last four or five years. So, um, different conditions to work in. And in the last two seasons, I suppose most exciting of all, actually really recovering the evidence for the Iron Age time, which underlies the Roman. So these two images show the progression from, uh, in, from 2013 uh, to 14, showing, you can see on these slides, the traces of the prehistoric occupation. And if you think that the trench is laid out according to the Roman street grid, so north, south, top to bottom, east, west. The Roman north, south street runs down the right-hand side. And you see how everything that's prehistoric runs northwest, southeast, or northeast, southwest. It's all a different alignment. And one of the major findings, I suppose, was to show that, although this is but a small part of the whole, uh, there is evidence for a regular prehistoric layout, which was then overprinted, overlain by the Roman in the mid-1st uh, century AD. So at the end of 2014, we had over this area of just over uh, 3,000 square meters, we had uncovered all, pretty much all the archaeology except <coughs> some beneath these Roman streets. So a complete sequence of showing that has the potential, because we're obviously still working on it, to show changing life, architecture, conditions from 1st BC to somewhere between the 5th and the 7th century AD. Um, and one of the most spectacular and enigmatic finds of this prehistoric period <coughs> is this great structure here. So that's pointing in a northeasterly direction, which uh, looks to be a part of a, a, a major building, a big hall for an Iron Age uh, chieftain. Um, surrounded by rubbish pits and wells of, of that period. And we've tried to give you a sense of what it might have looked like from what we've recovered. And this is very much interim work. Um, here, looking at the, that um, potential hall building here, reconstructed in relation to other timber frame buildings. And we're talking about a period at the very beginning of the first century AD, so just over 2,000 years ago. And just to give you some further sort of examples, just going up through time, uh, taking us into uh, the mid-first century, when here one sees the first impact of the Roman conquest, the Roman streets being overlaid, but yet a degree of continuity because Iron Age lanes running through the settlement continue to be used, and yet this <coughs> mixture of rectangular architecture, but also harking back these circular buildings, harking back to uh, Britain's prehistoric past. And uh, already people taking advantage of traffic on that main road, leading north up towards Dorchstrong Thames, and then south towards uh, Winchester, uh, taking advantage of passing traffic with sort of um, fast food outlets. <laughs> <laughs> and then moving on, and this again is interesting, this relationship between, if you like, the indigenous and the incoming Roman, and the, that, that, that story, that interplay of those, those two cultures. Here, by the turn of the first and second centuries AD, you see uh, the beginning of the construction of buildings, which really look perhaps 
familiar to what we think of as being Roman. So tile roof buildings, rectangular, two story, uh, but still a mixture of traditional use of, of thatching. Uh, going on. But what's interesting in this context was here you've got this unique sequence of a coming, there's something there pre Roman, and then it's transformed, is that buildings still are constructed along Iron Age alignments, even though all around they are surrounded by a Roman street grid, orthogonal east, west, north, south. There's still a persistence of something which has come through and um, this, this house is aligned exactly on, interestingly, the midsummer solstice and midwinter solstice. So those traditions are continuing well on. Um, so there's, there's, there's uh, not such dramatic change as one might have thought with the Roman conquest of the mid-first century. And then taking us right through to the fourth century with evidence of major reorganization, where, for the first time, buildings do align and relate to the Roman street grid. So, here, these narrow fronted properties coming onto the North South Street um, with their stone slated roofs, some thatched buildings, and a, a community which is perhaps not as urban as one might have thought in the sense that um, agriculture, stock raising, these are very important elements in the community right the way through. Um, to when the population diminishes, um, the settlement is abandoned somewhere between the 5th and the 7th centuries. So that's a little bit of a, a view of how that we've taken that story over those several centuries. Um, but as the archaeology diminished in Insula 9 in the last two years, <coughs> so this is Insula 9, we opened another area to. Um, do a slightly different form of archaeology to, again, to provide that uh, opportunity for, for our students, but also to explore some key questions which arose from Insula 9, one of which was we were finding um, Roman, you know, prestigious Roman building materials being reused as early as the late 1st century AD. And one possible context, looking at the Victorian record, was an area just to the south. So, the left of the screen is, is, is to the south in Insula 3. So there we worked the last two seasons, and um, what we were exploring was what the Victorians had thought to be the remains of a bathhouse at depth, apparently early, but um, we thought we could explore this. And in this time, we explored it simply by re excavating the Victorian trenches and just exposing that area. A, a much more economic excavation than Insula 9. And uh, even in this sort of, this, this, this um, if you like, rapid review, rapid reassessment, some amazing finds came out. And, and Amy Atkins here um, worked um, uh, developing all her skills in field archaeology, worked principally on exploring um, aspects of the architecture of, of this building, which was not a bathhouse, there's no way, there's no source of water. But it is early. This is the plan of 1891, and um, the area that we were looking at is just down here. This is what they thought was, call it baths. But in fact, we're looking at the Victorians have put together um, aspects of different periods, we've welded it into one. And we, in a sense, by looking at it again, have disaggregated the bits which belong to different periods to show that actually what we have here is uh, the remains of a first century a, a palatial building. Um, and these are the remains of the foundations, which you can pick out here on the trenches. You can see them coming up the walls here. Um, but it's not a bathhouse. Um, there's a complex history that takes place within the first century. So this is very early in the Roman period. And so this might well be the context of these exotic materials, these stones, these marbles, which we'd found in Insula 9, maybe one of the contexts. Um, and what, for the Victorians of 1891, was seen to be the clincher for the interpretations of the bathhouse, turns out to be totally unrelated, so enigmatic 
to a pipe core structure, but has nothing to do with what you see planned out here in these, in these remains. And they continue beyond our excavated area, these structures. And though there's this real possibility that in Insula 3, we have here, just by re exploring in 1891, the possibility of seeing something which extends right away across that insula. So that's, that's something to be, to be explored in the future. And even within the backfill of those Victorian trenches, masses of finds which had escaped the um, uh, archaeologists, well, the labourers of 1891. So just a selection, these have just come back from conservation. So this wonderful uh, horse harness, where you see the fitting here in the form of an animal head. Some say it's a panther, um, some say it's a dog. You can choose which you like. But, you know, some very fine um, brooches. This is a very early round brooch. And this is a little miniature, a little ritual spear that's been um, damaged, but a little ritual spear. But yeah, it all came out of this, this, this back foot. So, and perhaps most excitingly of all, were finds of these tiles, which are unique uh, to Silchester, tiles which carry the legend of the Emperor Nero. These titles. So, these tiles, um, the Latinists amongst you know, Jane Garth, who run this off, um, N E R for Nero, C L short for Claudius, C A E, the A and E, look at Chef Gell, Caesar, A U G for Augustus, and then finally G E R, Germanicus. Nero, Claudius, Caesar, Augustus, Germanicus. These tiles representing a project by the Emperor Nero in Kaleva, possibly associated with this development of the town in the mid-first century. And these occur in their greatest abundance in Insula III. So that was something unexpected, but builds up this complementary story where the two projects, as it were, come together. Well, all of this has been made possible thanks to phenomenal generosity. And uh, from 2005 onwards, we were raising from charitable donations from yourselves and from others £75,000 a year to keep this project going. And Amanda, running this fantastic field school, um, raising £40,000 to help keep this. I wouldn't say we always balance the book um, every year, but this is what was required. And so in you know, 2012, in order to get stuff in and out of the site with all that rain, we had to pay for um, extra tractor load to get the vehicles in and out. That sort of, you know, these unexpected things. But this was uh, generating, and your support has made this work and brought together, we think, something like 6,000 students have taken part in this project since 1997. <coughs> and all those that have wanted to go into archaeology, and some here have met already this afternoon, have gone on. They, uh, uh, I, I think, I hope they'll agree, uh, it's been a fantastic background for them, for their, for their careers. But it's also led to people doing all sorts of, you know, as one expects from a university, doing all sorts of other things. So that's been fantastic, but there is a big <coughs> but, is that there's a hell of a lot of stuff. Um, lots of finds, lots of records. And none of what we've done really adds up to much until it is published. And that's what we're really addressing now. So that just gives you a sense of, of some big numbers. So I think each of those 15,539 contexts or layers, the layers of the site as it built, they all contain finds to some degree. Um, and so a finds record, of which there are 55,000 records, that may refer to numbers of finds in their hundreds and thousands. And, um, it's just a, it's just a fantastic archive, and it's already generating interest in research with other universities. Um, for so, Western Australia, believe it or not, has an interest in what we're doing, um, and just up the road um, in, in Oxford and York and so on. And just to give you a sense of boxes disappearing into the distance, um, it. Um, uh, this used to be full of cows. <laughs> it's now full of boxes. And um, Emma, who's looking after the Silchester store, Emma, Emma Durham, 
um, has, has been uh, organizing this phenomenon. You can see the boxes disappearing in the distance. There are literally thousands of boxes um, that uh, we're working through. So a great challenge. And I suppose 2013 was one of those awful years because I could see the end of the project coming still at least one more summer to go. We didn't, you know, after 2012, who knew actually, actually how long it would take? Um, so there was the challenge of raising the funds to start writing it up, but the, I still had another season to fund. So 2013 was a bit of a, bit of a tricky year, but out of it, and uh, thanks to colleagues in the, in the development office, thanks to it, a million pounds <coughs> popped through the letterbox. Actually, the email went into my spam folder. <laughs> <laughs> and it was there for a week before I saw it, and I sort of fainted. You know. <laughs> um, but th this um, is making a fantastic difference to turning all that. We've calculated that students alone contribute something over 2 million man hours to the field work. So this is helping turn some of that into real knowledge and to actually research in depth the different categories of find and uh, eco fact that we've made. Uh, and it's also the foundation for the new work. And just to give you some examples of what we, can, we, we have to do and to learn, we have this amazing collection of Iron Age coins from the site. And those coins, each of them has a story to tell about their relations, for example, those up on the screen now appear to be a group of what are called Southwestern English coins. Our collection will add to the knowledge of the circulation and the power structures of Southwestern England at that time. Here are perhaps more recognizable uh, objects as coins. These are silver units, they're very small, a few millimeters in diameter, but they actually carry the first written words that occur um, in Britain. So you see uh, here on the right, you can see the name of this uh, gentleman here who styles himself with certain uh, treatment of his nose um, <laughs> in the form of a Roman emperor. He calls himself Verica. Here's another <coughs> Verica styled himself as Rex. So here we see Latin coming into England in the beginning of the first century AD. So these coins have a story to tell in relation to others and in relation to our understanding of the formation of political entities in England in the late first century BC. And this is, this is, this is very recent. Within the last uh, month, um, I've just had some of our glass assessed from the excavation. And this, not very prepossessing, you can see it's barely a centimetre size, but it's a multicolored Minifiore fragment from Silchester, which we now know to be only one of three of its kind um, uh, from Britain. And you probably believe the transformation, but it's from one of these. These wonderful polychrome glass vessels that were being made really about the time of the Emperor Augustus, um, turn of the first century BC, first century AD. They are wonderful, um, really prestigious objects which would have um, you know, decked the tables of the chief of the king, people like Verica in um, first century Calabria. So that's the kind of work. When these things come out of the ground, you don't have the expertise to analyze and study. You need the work, um, the resource, to take these forward <coughs> and, and appreciate their significance. And perhaps, well, I think one of the most important contributions of the project has been the new knowledge that's been generated about food, diet, and environment. And Lisa Lodwick will say a bit more about her work. This is her slide of some of her findings. Up. I suppose key amongst those is the discovery of Roman foods or Mediterranean food stuff like coriander, <coughs> celery, dill, and the olive being present in pre-Roman Britain. This is uh, very new and very important, but it's part of a much bigger picture which shows that change over five centuries. So this is a huge amount of painstaking work, not just extracting the samples from the ground, but then sorting through them to extract the evidence of the individual seeds um, and plant fragments. And to end on a slightly lighter note, um, it was quite something to uh, complete that project in the field. And I'd emphasize, because um, 
Altogether, I suppose we're talking about a 25-year period for this project, but it was a great moment, and I showed this slide a couple of times. It always, I, I enjoy, there's Amanda with the champagne, <laughs> Fulford with the Coke, which is not always the case. <laughs> but it, it was a, a, a triumphant end, and a great many people joined in the end of the party. Um, um, and, you know, <laughs> the end of the project, the Rim Reaper and so on, um, uh, but this is, <laughs> this is you, this is you, uh, the end of the, and some wonderfully, I won't say who was behind this, uh, probably embarrassed him, uh, but some wonderfully imaginative costumes. So, an end in that sense, but we're still really working away. And a huge number of organizations and individuals and your contributions have made this work over the years, and we've got a way to go, but the main foundation is in place to produce some really first-class scholarship to accompany all that phenomenal work that the students um, took part in. So that's the end of my, it's not quite time for questions, because I want you to, to meet three of the people, it's a small sample, and I know there are others in the audience who have taken part in this, but to introduce you to three so, undergraduate, master's student, and postgraduate. <coughs> now, a graduate, and now working as a member of the team. Lisa, I think, a little bit. But I'll start with Will Wilson, because it was Will who was behind some of the amazing talks to visitors. Um, this year, that was what he was doing. And Will will, will tell you about his, his experience. That's what he's done. I'll try and let you know about my experience at Silchester, it's quite sort of hard to sum up in a short space of time. It was incredible. That's sort of the best word that I can think to sort of sum it up. I've gained so many skills from this. So a lot of you will have seen me, bright orange, blonde hair, maybe even covered in blue paint, showing you guys all around it on the site. From this I've sort of developed that I would love to go into teaching. I mean, I, there was the day where we had to deal with 150 school kids in one day, which is quite a feat. But we managed, just about, we collapsed into chairs afterwards, but we really, really enjoyed it. And it's only through experiences like Silchester that I've been able to do this. So thank you guys so much for sort of making it possible. I've gained so many friends through, you know, doing this. My undergraduate dissertation is based on Kaleva. There's just so much that I've been able to learn from taking part in this field school. It's really, really, really special. Um, you know, I've made so, it's had so many friends, um, I've just worked, it's hard work, but it's rewarding hard work. You know, we've all put in so much to this. We've all developed so many, so many skills in so many different ways. I've not just been involved with the visitors team, I've worked in the trench with the environmental team and with the fines team as well. So it's not just a sort of single experience for a person. Everybody gets to have a chance to have a go at everything. So, as I keep saying, thank you. You know, this is genuinely amazing that we've been able to do this for the last, what, 18 years. I got involved in 2012. You know, it was during the two weeks when it was horrific weather, horrific rain. A bit typical, that had been my experience of archaeology until that point. But I kept on, and then in the 2013 and 2014 seasons, amazing sunshine. So, you know, mixed bag of results, but I've enjoyed every minute of it. So thank you all ever so much. And can I introduce now um, Amy Atkins. Um, Amy is a master student, and um, she's just, I mean, Will's just given me a present. Um, his dissertation, Maybe it's <laughs> another principal in our essay. Um, but Amy was a key part of the team um, in, in Insular 3 this year and, and got completely hooked by various aspects. What are you saying, Amy? Um, so, yeah, I'm a master's student. Um, I also did my undergraduate degree here. I joined the project in 2012 as a complete novice with a very shiny and unused trowel. And I've developed over the years to become a trainee supervisor on site, digging in Insula 3. Um, I dug the colonnade that Mike spoke about, 
and so I got to teach other students whilst pushing my own excavation skills. Um, I've also just written like a research paper on it, so I've got to see something through from excavating it myself to researching it, which is a really rare opportunity as an archaeology student. Um, I also got to get my face on television on Digging for Britain, which was really cool as well. <laughs> um, being part of still testing means I've got to spend six weeks of every year with my friends and other like-minded people. And I genuinely feel like I've joined a really large community of people that have been part of the project. I'm always meeting people that have been involved in it from however many years ago. And you do feel like part of a really big community. <laughs> Essentially, Silchester has given me skills that will be invaluable to my future career. I want to be a field archaeologist for a year and then do a PhD. Um, and I feel really well prepared for that and quite confident about my skills as well. So Silchester has done that. So thank you very much. <laughs> Yes, Amy was absolute star digging for Britain, which is <laughs> shown in January. Um, and now, now Lisa, um, Lisa Ludwig, I think, was it 2009? And Lisa has now become the, the powerhouse behind our environmental program. But um, yesterday evening, um, I was in Sirencester uh, for the opening of an exhibition. And once again, it's a food theme. Exhibition Food for Thought. It was looking at uh, Roman food, how things changed in Britain. And uh, Lisa was, um, and some of the, the Silchester collection was a major component of, of, a, of a wonderful exhibition in Sirencester at the Corinthian Museum. So if you're ever that way, and it's a lovely museum, then go and see it. It won't be on for very long, but it's, it's a lovely exhibition about Roman food. But Lisa, over to you. Thanks, Mike. So, um, yes, I did my undergraduate at a nearby older and larger university. <laughs> um, but I was really attracted to Silchester um, by the reputation and the opportunity to work on such a large um, excavation. So I wanted to do my master's in archaeobotany, which is looking at seeds and plant remains. And the kind of opportunity to work on such a fantastic site is just brilliant. So now it was back in 2009, um, I then was lucky enough to get Arts Humanities Research Council funding for my, for my PhD. So I looked at the plant remains from Insula 9 and compared it to other sites nearby. Um, so working at Silchester has given me a great practical skills. Um, I've learned to teach and supervise students and other field school attendees. Um, I've also learned how to process samples uh, and take samples in the field, which is great in terms of my future career, either in academia or if I go into commercial archaeology. Um, in terms of my own research, <coughs> I've just got the best data set really in the whole country. So I'm interested in looking at farming and food and how it changed from the Iron Age period through to the Roman period. So now I can say fantastic things about um, the new foods that we had in the late Iron Age, uh, new crops <coughs> which were being grown, so things like flax, uh, new types of hay meadow management, and this is all really important research. Um, finally, Silchester has given me the opportunity to communicate um, my research to a much wider audience. So I've been able to talk to the public at open days, um, also appear on Digging for Britain, and um, really kind of improve the impact of my research. So yeah, I'm just hugely grateful to Mike and the team for letting me get involved. I'm sure you'd agree. Uh, another great presentation, great contributions. We've got a few moments for questions. Who would like to ask? James, a microphone at the front. Could you just bring that over? Yeah. Thank you. Well, I hope I won't need the mic, but I might. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is rather a sort of in-house thing. Um, I was fascinated by the sheer length of the timeline. And this, and this really is one of the most important sites in the world, pre roman and all the rest of it. <coughs> I saw, uh, looking at these uh, artists' drawings, mm. not by Alan Sorrell, but getting there, mm. and also reflecting on what's still ongoing, as you know, now the trowel's been laid down, mm. which is the uh, digital reconstruction 
and they're currently as a member of Reading staff teaching this as an undergraduate module. Well, you, you, you've got the, 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 the ground plan, but on what basis do you determine the type of building, height of the building, whether it was thatched or not, and so on, which you really need for a digital reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, for any reconstruction. Um, the, the sort of, you're working for things like um, the thickness of wall foundations, if you're talking about masonry structures and what loads they can carry, with timber frame structures of which we have the, the, in the majority up until the second century, then you're looking at the size of the, the posts, the diameter which you can establish from the remains, the post holes in which they're placed. You can often get the actual post size. So the size and the spacing will give you a clue as to what. But there comes a point where it is conjecture, but you can use other sources of evidence for things like the roofing. So you saw a lot of thatch, and there's quite a lot of evidence from the sort of evidence that Lisa's been recovering uh, for thatch being a major, as, as it was in the Middle Ages in, in this sort of area, um, a major roofing material, and, and, and then the transitions with stone and tile. So the various sources you can draw on, but in the end there is obviously a, quite a big element of conjecture because there are no surviving examples of those sorts of buildings. Martin, thank you, Signal. Get the microphone to you. Professor Gilford, obviously you looked in 1995 and 1996 at the end of Roman Silchester, and you're now 18 years on and you found this incredible Iron Age settlement. But have you, I know you haven't published, but have you revised in any way your speculations or um, uh, understanding of the end of Roman Silchester as a result of other research and in other sites over that 18 year period? Uh, yes, very much so, because when we started, there was a view that Silchester's history, because it never developed as a medieval or modern town, that somehow it might have failed within the Roman period, and that might explain that, that failure. Well, what Insula 9 showed clearly, and, and earlier excavation really added to that, is that its story into the 5th century, after that sort of cut-off point of 409, 410, that its history is the same as any other town in, in southern England. Um, so it's what happens after, way after the Romans, which is significant. And so the, the idea which I think one could test is actually that the settlement continues there somewhere maybe into the 7th century, which is when you see the rise of the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Wessex. And Silchester so is on the boundary between Wessex and Mercy. It's a bit, you know, Berkshire is a sort of boundary county in a way, and, and Silchester is there, it's sort of almost a no man's land. And perhaps it's politically um, extinguished, if you like, to allow those powers not to be possibly threatened by a major entity on the boundary uh, between them. So that's a possible. But it's taking the story beyond the 400s to somewhere between the 550s and the 650s. The question in the middle there, and that we. we uh, I, I can probably shout, thank you. This is, um, it, it combines um, archaeology food and fish oil. Um, do, do we know if the Atrobates, did they eat fish? Can you trace from the Roman period back to the Iron Age fishing and fish? Um, very, very little fish. Um, I'll give you an absolute answer to that before the end of the year because we're working really on the Iron Age material now. Lisa, have you come up? Do you know any fish? Um, so the problem is that Silchester is on acidic soils, so fish bones kind of uh, decompose. So we have tiny amounts, which is probably a reflection of the small amount of fish and the genuine kind of decay of any bones which were there. So I, I can give, I tell you, we have from, from the 1980s excavation, we have one salmon bone. <laughs> so fresh, fresh fish, whereas by the 4th century you've got um, marine fish coming in in quite some quantity. No fishing rods, no hooks? Um, I don't think we have, no. No, we've got weaving equipment, but not fishing equipment. <laughs> I'll give the last question to Elizabeth, um, if we can just get the microphone. I know there's so many other questions to be asked, but there will be a chance afterwards. But... 
I was very interested to see that there were olives among the dietary things that were found. Presumably they were all brought, were they? Because we, they wouldn't have been able to grow them. No, they're, they're all imported, imported. yes. Yeah. yes. Um, as, as, as the food, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, please show your appreciation. <laughs> we do at the university. It was brilliant planning this afternoon. They got those nice connections and overlaps between our two presentations. And I'm sure you will uh, uh, acknowledge with me just um, what a great insight we were given into two actually quite different areas of research. But of course, uh, those connections were also apparent. And I'm hugely grateful uh, to Julie, to Mike, and to the others that took part. Thank you very much. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, please show your <laughs> Well, you have the opportunity now to go out, talk to these folks, uh, find out more. The two, proj the two areas that we've got downstairs, just to remind you, uh, exhibiting some of our work, and hopefully you'll get a chance to see all of that. And of course, uh, there is afternoon tea now being served. Thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon.